young newcomers and aging veterans. Unknown club pros and the superstars of golf begin four days of competition. In the beginning, they will not only be competing against each other, but against themselves. For golf is the most personal and self-centered of all sports. A man's performance is entirely his own affair. He is master or victim of his own destiny. On the first day, the man who mastered himself, when it mattered most, was John Schley. Schley has won just one tournament in a 10-year pro career, and only a few in the gallery had ever heard of him. But by the end of the day, his delicate skills would be recognized by everyone. One hundred fifty golfers competed on the first day, and only Hubert Green could match Lee's two under par 68. But the story of a professional golf tournament is not only about men, it's also about the land on which they compete. Each shot is a separate challenge and the golfer must measure himself against the task to be done. Each hole has its own character, its own subtle secrets which will reward accuracy, but penalize a lack of it. Tanglewood was redesigned for the PGA, and at the tournament's end, only six players would be under par. But every golf course, even the most difficult, must yield moments of brilliance to the exacting skills of professional golf. Throughout the second day of competition, rain added another element of difficulty to this most challenging course. But the soggy fairways did not bother Gary Player, who poured forth a succession of perfect strokes and set a new course record with a six under par 64, which tied the all-time PGA tournament record. The weather also had little effect on Bobby Cole, who ended the day tied for third with Player. Both Cole and Player were one stroke behind Hubert Green. And Green was one stroke behind the surprising John Schley, whose trusty putter gave him sole possession of first place with a two-day total of 135. morning before the competition begins, Joe Black, the rules chairman of the PGA, 
directs the changing of the pin placements on every green. This is the best spot right in here, and it's the lowest spot on the green, too. We haven't been able to use it all week because of the rain. That's about 15 feet, I think, that edge. Not too severe a break or anything. Let's go with that. Each time the hole is moved, new curves and contours will influence the path of the putt. And since more than one half of the total strokes of a tournament will take place on this surface, the new pin placements are charted for all the golfers. Although the PGA prohibits regular caddies, Alfred Dyer, Gary Player's regular caddy, is here to mark off the greens for Gary. 21. 21. You see what you do, what you do, you mark. You see, like it's 20, pin is 21 back, and you see it from trap to pin, eight. That's eight yards, you see? So that's how you get them, you see? Now, when player get to the front of the green, he knows how much he got from the front of the green to the pin. That's what you call, they call that dynamite yard. <laughs> Nothing like the putting green holds such deathless moments of suspense and pressure for both the gallery and the golfer. The professionals believe that a putter is a direct pipeline to a man's character. course receives as much attention from the golfers as the green. It is impossible to win in championship competition unless a man putts supremely well. On the third day, putting became a decisive factor, and the complexion of the tournament began to change. Gary Player was unable to regain the concentration of the previous day, and his championship drive petered out on the wet greens with a three over par 73. Hubert Green missed several times inside of six feet, and he too dropped out of contention with a 73. John Schley was often bold when caution might have served him better. He finished five over par, a tired and frustrated shadow of the man who had led the tournament for the first two days. Of the early leaders, only Bobby Cole remained in contention. But his chances for victory were squeezed between the two forces who would shape the drama of the final day. Jack Nicklaus and the merry Mexican Lee Trevino. After a 73 on the opening round, Trevino had surged into contention with a 66 on the second day. On the third day, using a putter, which he had found in the attic of the home in which he was staying, Trevino ran in crucial putts 
on five of the last six holes for a 68 and sole possession of first place. Another factor in Trevino's success was the rain-softened green. They held almost every shot and enabled Trevino to gamble more on his short irons. And he is most effective when he is most daring. Trevino would need all his skill and daring for the final day because the other man making the run for the title was Jack Nicklaus. No one has ever approached perfection more closely and more frequently than Nicklaus. He has won more major championships than any golfer who ever lived. For three days, Nicholas had played with power and precision, scoring rounds of 69, 69, and 70. And as the final day began, only Trevino and Cole stood between him and his fourth PGA Championship. At the beginning of the final day, Bobby Cole immediately grabbed the lead with a spectacular two on the par four first hole. Cole's brilliant eagle was followed by a bogey, and the remainder of his afternoon was sadly blighted by inaccurate tee shots and a dreary succession of missed opportunities on the greens. Cole's puzzling performance dropped him to third place, tied with Mike Hill and 62-year-old Sam Sneed, who came ghosting out of the fairways with a 68 on the final day. Sneed pulled four birdies out of his ancient bag of tricks, but his subpar round went virtually unnoticed because almost everyone at Tanglewood was following the final threesome, where two of the best golfers in the world were marching shoulder to shoulder toward a title only one could have. Jack Nicklaus, the defending king, concentrating only on victory, satisfied with nothing less. Lee Trevino, the clown prince, easy, loose, yet hardening under pressure to achieve. Trevino opened a two-stroke lead over Nicholas by playing his typical brash brand of hustler's golf. His accuracy with his irons put him inside of Nicholas almost every time they arrived at the green. and disappointed with his efforts on the fairways and in the bunkers. And yet his failings created the very kind of situation on which he thrives. The long pressure putt.
nerves as cold and as tempered as the steel in his clubs, Nicholas summoned his best strokes exactly when they were needed. Nicholas needed birdies, not pars. And at the end of 16 holes, his chances for victory seemed remote. But on the 17th hole, Trevino three-putted for a bogey. Get in. Get in. Nicholas quickly closed in for a par, and Trevino's lead was now down to a solitary stroke with one hole left to play. After four days of competition, after 71 holes and 16 miles of golf, the 56th annual PGA Championship would be decided in the last 440 yards. was closer to the pin. But just as important was the fact that Nicholas was in the frog hair, not on the green, and therefore not permitted to clean his ball. With Trevino only 18 feet from the cup and almost certain to par, Nicholas needed this birdie putt for a chance to win. Nicholas could not sink it, and now one of the most treasured trophies in golf would belong to Lee Trevino if he could reach the cup in two strokes. Trevino's first putt ended a foot from the hole, and he nervously asked permission to putt out. Nicholas and Hubert Green nodded approval, and the 56th annual PGA Championship was over. With a four under par 276, Lee Trevino had conquered the course as well as his competitors. And he could look back on the long green fairways of Tanglewood and know that he walked on them as a champion.
Thank you.